Good afternoon everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll get started in just a moment, but before we do, and whilst we give others a chance to join, we're just gonna take part in a bit of a housekeeping here. So um, firstly, please can we ask teachers and parents to field any questions to us via the chat function. And also just be, be mindful and kind in the chat. Remember the audience there. Try to stick to questions if possible. In the interest of safeguarding, if you're joining us as part of a home educated group, then please name yourself as first name only. If you're part of a school, then use your school name or your teacher's name. Obviously cameras and microphones are switched off for you guys. And finally, we'd like to note that as open events, these events on occasion <clears throat> may be attended by members of the wider public. However, We've made every attempt to screen all the registration um, for, to ensure that everyone on, on the call today, on this live stream, is from a school or is um, home educated. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, folks, well, we're going to crack straight on with our live stream today. Um, welcome again, and thank you so much for joining our Last Chance to Paint webinar with special guest and artist, John Dyer who's cruising around in the background here. Um, my name is Robbie, um, and I'm coming, you, coming to you from the world's largest rainforest in captivity. This biome is absolutely bursting with beautiful plants, amazing plants that show us how we are connected to the world's tropical rainforests wherever we live. Now, I'm well aware that many of you have never visited Eden Project before, and so what we'd like to do is just share a quick video clip with you to give you a flavour for Eden. So, Rob, if you could roll that clip for us, please. Okay, folks, welcome back. So hopefully that gave you a bit of a flavor for Eden Project. Now today we're, we're gonna be learning all about the tropical rainforest and we're gonna be focusing in on the food of the gods, cacao, all while painting along with artist John Dyer. Now John's in the background here. Let's go and uh, speak to John and see how he's doing. Hi, Robbie. Hi, right, John, Hi. how are you today? I'm hot. <laughs> It's incredibly hot in this rainforest. It's not just like the biggest captive rainforest in the world, it's also the hottest captive rainforest in the world. But yeah, thank you. Absolutely, and can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing today? Yeah, well, Last Chance to Paint is, just as it says in the title, we are in danger of losing things all the time. And uh, Last Chance to Paint focuses on things. So today we're looking at chocolate as it's Easter, and potentially in around 40 years time, we might lose chocolate because of climate change, because as it gets hotter, um, the plants, these beautiful cacao trees, they don't like it. So we, what I want to do is do a painting of the cacao trees. I want you to paint along, the children to paint along. And I want that to be a call to action so we can all make small changes in our lives so that we don't keep fueling climate change. Excellent. Thank you, John. That's a really good summary. Um, so just to be aware, you can actually find all three of John's previous um, live schemes of work from previous live streams. Um, on his website and we'll put a link to that in the chat for you and, and also just to be aware the Eden Project itself has a host of resources for teachers so we'll pop a link to those for you in the chat as well. Now in a moment John is going to get cracking with his painting. You're probably wondering why he's not stood in front of a canvas. Um, he's actually going to be painting today on an iPad using a program called Procreate which yes. I'm sure he'll tell you more about. Yeah, well, Pro Procreate is a fantastic app for painting. The reason I'm doing this rather than an actual painting um, is we can screen share this with you so much easier. So you're going to see exactly what I do on my iPad. And um, it's going to start off with a white square, and I will use the same process I use as I paint, but you'll get a much better view. 
Procreate are one of our wonderful sponsors. So one of those schemes of work is the Amazon Rainforest, another one's Borneo and another one is Kenya. But the Amazon Rainforest Procreate sponsored us to do that. Go and do it, it's immersive. You get 10 videos, do it over 10 days. There's tribal music, um, there's a blog. And at the end of that, you can do the most amazing Amazon painting of the rainforest. But today, it's cacao, chocolate. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, John's gonna get started. And I would invite you guys to get started as well at home or in your classroom. Please don't worry if John's going a bit quick. He's quite used to doing this kind of thing. Um, so yeah. we will be taking pauses and also you can always finish off your, your painting um, after the live stream finishes. So um, John. I'll, I'll get going. So I just sort of narrate what I'm doing. So I'm just going to be painting in the rainforest and then on top of that, we'll put these beautiful cacao trees. And so to start off, I'm going to put some background colors in using a broad brush and some pale yellow. And I can choose my different colors. You can mix this up. Don't, you don't have to copy me exactly. Um, use your own colors. You could make this pink like a sunset, but I'm deliberately using some paler colors so that when you put the other colors on top of your wet paintings, um, they don't get too mixed up. I, I'm choosing colors I know will probably work quite well for you using wet on wet. Now I've set up this appropriate to sort of mimic wet on wet, but um, these colours will help to do that. Do you see how it blends here at the bottom? That's a bit like your paints will do. So very fast brush strokes off the side of your paper. Once I've got that in, I can start to look at some of the basic shapes here of the plants. And then you can use any sort of colours that you like. I'm going to use some oranges in here, and I'm going to bring in some of these beautiful palms. Um, and we get a shot over there of what I'm looking at. You can see what a beautiful rainforest it is. So I'm just going to start to draw in some of these trees in the background, some of these palms, and then afterwards we will put the cacao trees on top. So just draw in some very loose shapes of where these palms and these trees would be in the back of the rainforest. Today I'm not going to put in the, the wonderful roof of the Eden Project biome. Uh, we've only got, uh, well we've only got sort of 45 minutes or so to do this and that would be quite complicated. Um, so I'm just Pretending we're in, well, it is a real rainforest. I'm ignoring the roof of that deliberately. So once you've done that, then you can bring in some colors, maybe some deeper greens, and then I can start to put on, maybe with a slightly thinner brush, I can just pull on here on that. And you see the colors already picking up, a bit like yours, Will. Some of that yellow is going into the green, but that works fine. Yellow and green makes a limey green. Um, I've got the disadvantage that not only am I boiling hot, I'm stood up, which is not ideal when holding something like an iPad in one's hand. However, this is just an idea of how I construct a painting and, and we will talk quite a lot about the cacao plant as well and the whole ecosystem. Now I have seen um, cacao plantations in Costa Rica a few years back. And it's very interesting, and I'm going to draw a plant in here, which is a banana plant, that a lot of the farmers will grow the cacao plants beneath banana plants, and they use that for shade for the cacao trees. And as our climate heats up in places like Latin America and Africa, where cacao comes from, that heat is why the cacao plant and chocolate, and your favourite chocolate, is under threat and there's a last chance to paint subject. Um, so there we go, I'm gonna draw in a banana. Hopefully you can see not only me, but you can see this painting that I'm doing. I'm gonna put another banana in here. I haven't pre-decided what I'm drawing here or what I'm painting, digitally painting. I'm just doing this on the fly and it's just an idea. You don't have to copy it exactly. This is not a paint, paint along or paint by numbers. Just get the general idea. Once we've got those bananas, I could get some yellowy paint and I could put that on the top as if it's catching the light and then I put some of the veins of the leaves on. And banana in its own right is an incredible crop. Over 400 million people um, every day rely on banana and plantain, which is a savory form of banana, as their staple food. So whereas we might have wheat, bread, in other parts of the planet, um, it will be banana and plantain. And again, that's an incredible um, story in its own right. So I'm going to take some of this yellow and I'm going to build in some other tropical plants in the background, palms. And I'm going to bring in some sort of lianas coming down from the rainforest all the way down here. Maybe just a little bit like snakes, just to make it look really jungly 
and then maybe even choose a greeny, a greeny grey colour than that. Do you know, I love doing this. I hope you find this as relaxing as you can in the hour. But I think this is a great way to learn and a great fun thing to do. There we go. Okay, John. Well, so I've actually got a couple of questions that have come in already. Okay, great. So I'm going to field the first one of those to you. Yeah. So, John, what is your favourite place to paint? Oh, that's a really good question. Well, I love painting here at the Eden Project. But I also love it on of course. I love it on Tress Gravy Gardens, which is full of tropical plants like this. It's a small island off the coast of Cornwall. It's really hard. It's basically the last subject. So go back a year. I was painting the very last two northern white rhino. That's a project I hope you run in your class. We call that Precious Africa. Very important subject to paint. So that was, I don't know, very emotional. But I've kept that painting for myself. So it depends. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's lovely. And, and ooh, here's a really interesting, I love this question. So what is your favourite painting that's been painted by a different artist? That's a great question. Oh, I, do you know... As, as with the rest of the world, I've got to love Van Gogh's Starry Night painting. I think it was absolutely groundbreaking at the time. All of his work was groundbreaking. Um, it carries such power and emotion. And I think the important thing about all of Van Gogh's work, but Starry Night in particular, is he paints something more than you can see. He paints from his heart and his soul. And that's what painting, that's what art should be. We don't need to copy life slavishly. Um, we've got cameras, we've got smartphones. So we're free to interpret the world as we're doing now. I'm changing the colours, the things that Starry Night. Got to love Starry Night by Van Gogh. So how much, when you're painting, how much of your painting is, are you really thinking through or are you just sort of reacting to the feelings you're getting and they're coming out on the, on the canvas? Well, as you've seen, I haven't done a drawing. I'm just reacting. So it's none of it's planned at all. Um, so what I'm doing here, I'm just reacting to the shapes and the forest around me. And if I pre-plan it, it very much turns into an illustration. And there's nothing wrong with an illustration. It could be really powerful. But for me, as an artist, being able to react very quickly to the world is a great joy. And, yeah, doing this now, looking at this beautiful cacao tree um, just in front of me, it's lovely because I'm noticing things. On it. I'm noticing the texture. I'm noticing where the light falls on it. And I'm using some darker brown for the shade. And it was the same with the rhinos. Two huge northern white rhinos walking around with me. Um, very difficult to paint and you can't plan it, you just have to react to it. So just, en just enjoy, enjoy it and don't judge it. You're, you might think your friend's is better or worse than yours. You might think, think that yours is fantastic or not fantastic. It's not, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the joy you get from the moment and also some of the learning with that. Any other, any other questions? Oh, there are, yeah. So it's really about the process rather than yep. particularly setting out with something that you definitely have in mind. Yes. Um, and the last question for a moment, another great one. What's your favourite media to work with? Uh, acrylic paint is my favourite. Um, it's, it dries really fast. It's good to travel with. I'm allowed to take it on and off an aircraft if I'm travelling to the Amazon rainforest. Um, they don't like oil paint. And also, it's very flexible, so I can roll my paintings up on canvas and bring them home. Yes. Which, which is really good. So that's my favourite uh, paint to work with. Um, but, you know, this digital painting is great as well. But you're probably using poster paint in your schools or watercolours, and they're also beautiful to use. <clears throat> Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I have seen you paint once before, and I think I noticed then that you did start with the background then, and I'm pretty sure you started with the background today. Yeah, I did. So why did you start with the background? <laughs> Because otherwise, if you start with the foreground, you end up basically colouring in the gaps. Whereas you put the background down, and I deliberately put a pale background down so that the children working with the wet paint won't have a technical issue with it. Because it's picking up that colour, right. but it's not going to interfere with the colour on top. But I work very traditionally, from the top of the painting, from the sky to the foreground, and from the background to the foreground. So the last things I'll put in will be, today, the insects, hummingbirds, and the cacao pods. Okay, absolutely. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm just thinking, like, we've got all these students from all around the country and much further afield, different countries even. What are your top tips, things for them to bear in mind as they, as they work their way through their painting today? Um, okay, top tips. Don't worry about it. Sometimes my paintings go wrong. I wipe them off. 
I turn them upside down, I start again, doesn't matter. Um, as long as you enjoy today, that, that's, that's what you want to do. Sometimes you need to take away from the painting. If the big blob of paint is too much, just get a dry brush and just lift it off. That's absolutely fine. And uh, clean your brushes often. And uh, even if your water goes very brown and muddy, you can wipe them on a bit of tissue that schools often tend to have for lots of grazed knees. There's always a tissue on there. Use those to clean your brushes. Use a wider brush for the background and a fine brush for foreground elements. And I can change that on, on my app, wider or thinner. But okay. use a range of brushes. Absolutely, yeah, and it's looking like it's starting to sh uh, take shape already. I'm just uh, looking over your shoulder there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the project Last Chance to Paint and any visits you've had to tropical rainforests or cacao growing regions? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so just to reiterate, the idea of Last Chance to Paint is to have a lot of fun, is to allow children to travel with me and my team to extraordinary locations, to explore tribal life, wildlife and ecosystems, and to put a call to action around climate change. Um, so, and then you can all be the change at home as well by planting trees, by not paving over your garden, by eating a little less meat, maybe making sure your school has a meat-free Monday. Little things will make a big difference. So last year I was in Kenya working with the Maasai tribe. There's a four-year drought in Kenya. It's quite shocking to see children having to drop out of school. Um, because there's no money to pay for them, as, as the, the Maasai's wealth is in, in cows and cattle. Because of the drought, they're down to one or two, and it has an impact on everything. It's not the Maasai's fault there's a drought, <clears throat> it's nobody's fault. It's certainly not my fault or your fault or the children's fault. Collectively, there's a problem. Yeah. So that's what it's about. I've also been to the Amazon rainforest to paint and learn from the Yawanawa tribe, and I recommend schools run that project. Ten videos, music, um, blogs, travel with me. I'll still take a Q&A with schools on the website every week. So that's, you know, not live, but within a day or so. And also Borneo with the Penang tribe and the beautiful orangutans. I've seen what's happened oh, yes. to the forest there. That was literally at the edge of deforestation with the rainforest burning and coming out of the sky in clumps. Very sad, but also a lot of positivity. There's a lot of good work going on there. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so lots of people and organisations around the world who are trying to make a difference about this, uh, these challenges. Yes, like, like Eden Project. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Okay, folks. Well, John's going to carry on painting and please carry on painting as well. Um, but I'd also like to introduce you to someone else, an employee here at Eden Project. This is Emily. Hi, Emily. Hello, Robbie. So Emily is one of our explainers and tail makers here at Eden Project and she's basically an expert on all things Eden um, and her job is to really communicate the Eden message to people and to tell them about the am amazing and unique plants that we have. So Emily, could you just tell us a little bit about Eden and actually, you know, what is Eden all about? Yeah, absolutely, Robbie. So Eden, our mission is about demonstrating and inspiring our visitors to become planet positive, uh, the positive action that they can take for our planet. And we highlight this dependency and this connection to nature through stories about plants. So here at the Eden Project, you can already see some of our cacao behind us. We celebrate and showcase so many different plants from all over the globe. So coming to Eden is almost like exploring the entire world in a day and learning about your place in it. Absolutely, yeah, exploring the world in a day. And I was going to mention that later on as well, I think. Excellent. Um, so what does Eden itself do um, to actually help with the, with the world's rainforests? So many different things. For example, public education. So sharing with our visitors just how incredibly important rainforests are and making sure that they know how to help and be part of the solution. But it's also about making our entire site rainforest friendly. All the products, all the foods that we sell are linked to positivity in terms of the rainforest and ensuring that not only are the rainforest protected but the people in it. But then that leads to our suppliers. So all the different products that we are buying into the site are also adhering to our ethos about protecting rainforests. For example, no palm oil. But then you also have the fact that we help work, support, promote organizations and campaigns that are doing what we're trying to do, for example, Cool Earth, WWF, for example. 
Excellent, thank you. So it sounds like there's loads going on and there's loads of things we'll talk about more later on that how we can get involved and how we can help as well. Okay, folks, so we'll come back to Emily in a little while because I'll have some more questions for her. Um, thank you. Let's just head back to John for a second, see what he's, uh, see what he's up to. Yeah, I'm actually putting some of the, the flowers on the trees, um, on the cacao trees, and I've got some reference um, because I can't see the flowers. They're actually really, really tiny, but they're fascinating because they come straight out of the um, trunk of the cacao tree, don't they? Absolutely, they <coughs> do, and, yeah. And there's a very interesting, I'm going to put some insects in here as well. So when I was in Costa Rica uh, painting the cacao and the banana farming, I just, I've never seen so much biodiversity of insects in my life. They were literally everywhere. And beautiful hummingbirds. But there's a very particular insect that pollinates the cacao tree. And they're so small that you can't see them. They're, they're microscopic. Yeah. So they're called noceums. Oh, so wow. I'm going to put some noceums in here, but they'll be much bigger than reality if we get the time. Um, because it's all part of, of uh, the problem of just saying, oh, well, it, it's got too warm in... West Africa to grow cacao, well, let's move it north to the Mediterranean. But is the ecosystem there to support the noceums? It isn't. So this is why we need to be careful of climate change um, disrupting too many things too quickly because the world doesn't have time to react. So if we can just, as I said, if we can just tread gently on planet Earth, as gently as we can, then we buy ourselves more time. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, John. I love that. No seams. That sounds like a, a story to me. We might have to get cracking on a story about the no seams, or maybe right. you could do that back in school. Robbie, what I'm going to do, because I'm going to put a no seam into my painting now. Ooh, lovely. Right? It's going to be gigantic compared to what they really like, but that's what I'm going to paint on the screen now, a no seam. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, so I'd like to bring in another special guest, actually, if I may. So um, this is Aaron. He's one of our horticulture team leaders here at Eden Project. And Aaron is basically an expert on all things tropical rainforest biome related. Um, Aaron, how are you doing? Hey Robbie, good. good. So thank you for coming and speaking to us today. Could you tell us a little bit more about the tropical rainforest biome, please? Well, first of all, we have the largest greenhouse in the world. We host thousands of species of plants and we have four main areas. We have Southeast Asia, Oceanic Islands, South America, and South, uh, Oceanic, Southeast Asia, West Africa, sorry. And one of them is crops, Whittling's beautiful with cacao, a South American plant. We also have it around the biome, so it's an incredible place to see. It always ranges between 18 and 35 degrees, so it's quite variable. It's nice, warm, humid, 60-90% humidity. Lots of plants and animals to see here. It's just a, a great day. Excellent, thank you. You really painted a picture and I can tell you it is hot and humid in here today. Um, so the cacao trees themselves, what can you tell us about those trees and, and how they grow and the cacao pods? Well, these trees are incredible. They are South American originally and they grow in rainforests. So they need heat and humidity and they produce flowers and fruits all year. So they are very rewarding to grow. We don't face many challenges because we provide most of the conditions they like. So as you can see, we have happy trees growing. Our only issue might be pests sometimes. We control them easily and we are rewarded with a lot of pots all year round. Okay, yeah, so that's an interesting one actually. So what do you do about pests that might start attacking the plant? How, how do you deal with them? Well, we have a friendly approach. We use biocontrol. So we use other insects that feed in the harming insects for us. It's a, a more natural way and we avoid using chemicals at all. Okay, and what sort of pests are we talking about? Can you tell us about any of the usual suspects? Aphids. It's this little green nasty box and they, they will feed on the younger leaves in the new season. So we just have to keep a, an eye on them before they get to our plants. Okay, thank you. So obviously we're trying to grow and very successfully growing cacao trees here, but we, we, we are in Cornwall, we are in a greenhouse. Um, 
how how do we ensure that we can always keep them healthy and what, do they need any special nutrients in the soil that they would have in a normal rainforest that they don't have here they usually grow on their larger trees they like the, the canopy shade so we don't have larger trees above our cacaos because the biome itself provides some shade and we have to keep in the water, humidity and soil health in general so we have this mulch to control the, the pH in our soil and they are happy. Excellent okay and I know Tom's been filming those beautiful cacao pods so when they go that golden yellow color that's when they are ripe. I was just wondering though do the trees always have cacao pods on them? Aaron? We usually have them from October November until April and the other half of the year we have flowers. They're not seasonal here. Okay, thank you. That's excellent. Um, I might have an extra question for you in a moment, so don't go anywhere. But Rob, I was wondering if you could roll the clip, which just shows, will show the students what it looks like inside a cacao pod, please. Okay folks, so hopefully you're able to see inside the cacao pods, see those beans when you, when you chop into them, they're that rich purple colour, aren't they Aaron? Yes, beautiful colour. Absolutely beautiful colour. Now I was just thinking, um, the last question I've got for you, if you've got time still, um, the children and John, they're busy painting all the beautiful colours of the rainforest, they're trying to capture the shapes of the rainforest. Can you tell us about the adaptations that the plants have? What features do the plants have that help them to survive here? Yes, in the rainforest we see most adaptations are facing uh, water and sun because as you know it's a very challenging environment. It rains a lot, there's not so much light. So cacao has uh, good examples of the shape of the leaves. They're pointing downwards, so the excess rain will fall away from the roots and avoid damaging them. Also the red leaves, the new leaves, color red diffracts light, so the light won't damage the newest leaves before they can be uh, stronger as adults. It's just amazing adaptations they have. They are also adapted to grow flowers straight from the trunk, coliflory, that helps insects to pollinate the flowers in, a, in an easier way. It's another adaptation we see a lot in the rainforest. It's an amazing plant. Excellent. Thank you so much, Aaron, for coming to speak to us today. Uh, I'll catch up with you later, no doubt. We're going to head back to John, see how he's getting on. Check he's still with us. Hi, Hi John. Robbie. How are you? How are you getting on? Doing all right. So I've zoomed out so <clears throat> everybody can see the whole picture. I had to zoom in to do the noceum, which is, I'll just zoom in quickly to show the noceum. Here we go. There's one of those. Lovely. And I zoomed in to put a hummingbird because I saw so many hummingbirds um, about, uh, you know, when I was over there. So they do, the hummingbirds aren't pollinators of cacao, but they are there <laughs> in Costa Rica. So I'm just putting some form onto the cocoa pods. They've got this lovely stripe to them. And then I'm going to put some of the, these lovely veins in the, in the leaves. You can see up here, as the light shines through, they've got the veins of the leaf structure. So that's my next task. I will leave it zoomed out as I work so everybody can see. Excellent, thank you so much John. And I was just wondering, you kind of hinted at it then, but what sorts of techniques are most useful to help you capture that detail that you're trying to show? Um, well, you can't zoom in and out on a real painting. No. But you can move your face closer and you can use a really fine brush. 
and if you've got a brush that's a sort of a rather than a flat brush like a centimeter wide brush it might be flat you can um, you can roll the brush in the paint to kind of make it a point or make sure your brush isn't splayed get a good brush and then get just the right amount of paint not too much and then you can almost draw with the paint a little bit like I'm doing now on these leaves so it's practice really but there's no there's, you can't make a mistake with this it's, it's, it's a fun thing to do Absolutely. Okay, John, thank you very much. And I was wondering if you could tell us any more about your memories from visits to cacao plantations. What, what struck you the most about some of those trips? Um, the snakes that I didn't see. <laughs> so I was there in my trainers and, you know, my sort of tropical clothes, all very uh, European. And the farmers would be there. Um, the main thing all the farmers had was Wellington boots up to their knees. Really, so when they're walking around, there's lots and lots of leaf matter on the floor lots of chopped bananas um, and lots of cacao leaves and the snakes love to hide and live in amongst that. So I felt very vulnerable because nobody told me to take Wellington boots. Um, I also remember everything's done with a machete. So all the farming's done with literally just one large machete, sort of chopping cacao pods off, chopping bananas, great big bunches of bananas off and clearing the ground with a machete. I, I have no idea how useful just a machete could be. So. And then, of course, in the background, the background music of Costa Rica is howler monkeys and the constant buzz of insects and the, and the croak of tropical frogs and, and the glittering starry nights with no light pollution. It's, it's incredible. And driving down the coast of Costa Rica to see the cacao plantations, <coughs> crabs all over the beaches and just a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Absolutely, John. John yeah. painted a picture in my head then. <laughs> Excellent. I was transported to Costa Rica and I'm struggling to get back to Cornwall. Um, but I am back. Um, so I'd really like to actually speak to Emily again if I can, because Emily would like to tell us a bit more about the story of chocolate and how we get from a cacao pod to actually a finished bar. Tell us about that, Emily. Yeah, absolutely. So the pods themselves, there are usually 30 to 40 beans inside. The beans are removed and there's a sticky substance called baba, this pulp. Without it, we wouldn't have the smell and the aroma of the chocolate that we're used to. So people, by hand, once they're cut, they take all the beans from the inside, lay them on the rainforest floor, they ferment after seven days, they're then taken to local villages to be dried, usually by hand, then sacked up then transported to the ports around the world. So imagine now we're like Willy Wonka and our beans arrive in our factory and we literally wash them. And once they're washed, they get roasted. And I've got some beans here that have been roasted and I wish you could all smell them. They smell absolutely incredible. And they have a shell around them. So those shells are removed during a process called winnowing cracking. And then they're crushed to look like this, these nibs that you can see. Now this is still not ready to be a bar of chocolate. So what happens is this gets heated up. And once it's heated up, it includes all of this fabulous fat called cocoa butter. Sugar's then added, other ingredients are added. It's molded, it's wrapped, it's sold. Incredibly long journey. Wow, I'm not sure I caught all that. that sounds like a, a massive process to get from a bean to bar there. Um, so imagine all of that going into making that final bar of chocolate that we might buy in the shop, a real, a massive chocolate chain, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. It's an incredibly long journey. And what absolutely blows my mind is that just one little pod where they've got 30 to 40 beans, it might make a very, very small bar of chocolate. So it takes about a kilogram of those beans I was showing you to make an average bar of chocolate. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now, I just wanted to sort of think about the, the cacao farmers themselves and the cacao industry. What, what's life like for cacao farmers and what challenges do they face? And also, what can we do, even though we might be thousands of miles away from them, to help? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Robbie. Here in the UK, where we are, we're 4,000 miles away from the nearest tropical rainforest. So why should we care? Well, we should absolutely care. Chocolate being one of those many commodities that we get. Chocolate is really labor intensive in terms of how it's harvested. And quite often in this multi-billion dollar industry, quite often it's the farmers that don't get a fair amount of money. So if any of you are in uproar and think that's not okay, well, actually there's something we can do. 
fair trade, rainforest alliance, and these non-government organizations that are doing what they can to enable these people to have a fair amount of money for the work that they have done. And it's by what we buy to what we can afford to buy within our households. So we do have control in some way. Absolutely. And at Eden, we like to use the phrase that your wallet is your weapon. So you can make a difference to people thousands of miles away by just thinking carefully about what we do or don't buy. Um, now, I've got one more question for you, actually, Emily, because um, sometimes rainforests can feel like a long way away. You said 4,000 miles, and it can be tricky to know how to help, but we've already got some ideas about what we can all do. But what about our own environment where we live, closer to home? What can we do to help the environment and nature where we live? Here at Eden, we so often say that you could be a doer, a learner, a shopper, or a shouter. Now, I like to think we're a combo of all four of those things. Say you're a learner, say you go out and you research something in more detail, you then have the knowledge of something to then have the option whether to care and protect it or not. Knowledge is power. It's about perhaps being more mindful. I think all of us are trying to do, especially as consumers, to be that bit more aware of our part to play with the environment, where our foods come from, and um, that change is possible. I truly believe it. Absolutely. So it's all about positivity and working together to build the kind of future that we all want to be part of. Thank you, Emily. I'm going to head back to John. Hope he's still with us. Here he is. Um, I am. John, how are you getting on? What's happening? I'm doing good. I'm just working in more detail. <clears throat> Excuse me, putting in some more plants in the foreground, layering on these exciting shapes. I love the forms of tropical plants. Um, they have lots of sword shaped leaves, and that's I mean, it's pouring with rain here at the moment. Um, but that's so they can get rid of the water, so they can do their transpiration process. Uh, so that's really good um, to see that and to get that into the painting. I'm starting to look at, <coughs> excuse me, God, um, I frog in my throat. Uh, it's really good to look at the light using some pale yellows and just to bring some of that where it might be catching the branches. Just imagine where the sunshine is coming down as it is now in, in the Eden Project. Um, and just putting fine brush strokes, building up the surface of this painting and you know when, when you were talking there to Emily it was, I was just remembering what um, the cacao bean tastes like straight out of the pod that white gelatinous thing it's just, yes it's fascinating um, fascinating flavor can't describe it it's nothing like chocolate <laughs> no it's a, a bit like mango I've heard yeah softer but softer yeah. banana -y mango yeah, and very yeah. sweet yes absolutely yes, okay yeah. Um, so, well, whilst you carry on for a moment, I've actually got uh, a few questions here. I've got loads of questions, oh, actually. Um, so, um, how about, uh, do you paint animals? And if so, what do you like to paint? Oh, I do paint animals. And if you follow some of our schemes of work, particularly the, um, <clears throat> the one in Borneo with orangutans, love painting orangutans, because basically a square body and very long arms and legs. It can be any shape, so, and sort of a figure of eight face. Uh, you've got to do the Borneo project in your classes, um, but also in Africa last year, painting elephants, rhinos, giraffe, um, you know, uh, antelopes, uh, hippopotamus. Wow. They're great, fantastic. So I do like painting them. Um, my favourite animals, I think, are birds. I love okay. birds. And your favourite <clears throat> bird to paint then, John? Probably a seagull. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we're yeah. formal. Um, and how about why did you choose to be an artist? What's drawn you to become an artist? That's a good question. Well, I, I grew up in a family of artists. So my, my mum and my father, my father's a well-known artist. Um, that was my life, surrounded by paintings, surrounded by my family. I was lucky. So even though they were insanely busy and were working till 10 or 11 at night, they were there. So we were all together. I really liked that. I decided I wanted to be involved in cre creativity. So, because creativity is painting, it could be designing a garden, making a, a TV show or film, it could be doing a radio broadcast, designing furniture, designing the, the, the designing an item of clothing, yep. shoes, the microphone you're holding, a car. There's no end to where creativity gets involved. Like, wow, what a powerful subject. So. I always painted, I always drew, I did loads of photography, I loved taking pictures, and I went to art school, did a year foundation course, got involved in graphic design, and studied that for my degree, so the use of letter forms, how to lay out magazines, yeah. and nowadays websites, um, uh, I guess everything to do with how do you get something on a printed page or a website. <clears throat> and then during that process decided 
I was major in photography, went to the Amazon rainforest and did a big photography exhibition for a TV company, came back, never took a picture again, apart from family photos, and painted ever since. Wow. And the reason was, I travelled Brazil, went to some tributaries up the Rio Negro, maybe people had never been before, taking pictures, and for me, I couldn't pack it all into one photograph. It was something in my heart that needed to be painted, because it was experiences from the day before, yes. experiences now, experiences that I'd had as a child, colours I'd seen, tastes I'd had. Paint could do that for me, so I painted. That's when I became a painter. Oh, that's lovely. So through painting, you can actually paint what you want to show and maybe capture things you can't actually capture in photographs. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and it should be really quite personal, I believe. You're not aiming to recreate a photograph. You're not in competition with photography. You can use photographs. I've got some reference here. Yes. Um, but a painting is something special. And I could only celebrate the world in the way I wanted to through paint. Excellent, lovely, thank you, John. So we're getting towards the end of our, our live stream today. We've still got loads of questions coming in and I might try and get a hold of some of, the, of those questions in a moment. John, can you just tell us, what do you think you would do next to finish this painting off? I know it's not finished yet, but what yeah. would you do? Uh, we've got, what have we got? Just under 20 minutes um, to go, I think. So I'm gonna look at, now it's gonna be details. Looking at details, looking at pattern, and looking at sunlight. So we have details on the cacao pods, it's going to be some extra details and there's the arms in the background and looking at where sunlight might be falling on different elements in it, imagining where that sun is. Okay, thank you John. Okay folks, so hopefully you're able to take some of those ideas and those top tips from John and carry on there uh, with, your, with your paintings. Um, I'm just going to go to our little, what's become our kind of wall of questions actually. Um, because I do have another question for John. Quite like yep. the look of this one. Yeah, um, it's not hard, is it? <laughs> what's your favourite country to visit? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, I've not been to that many countries, but I've been to uh, quite a few. So I've been to Peru, love Peru. I was there painting the potato harvest, of all things. Um, yeah, so Peru's amazing. Brazil, I've been to a couple of times. Extraordinary. Uh, Japan, I've done a whole touring exhibition around Japan. If you want to go to the future, time travel, go to Japan. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah. Top tip, go to Japan for time travel. It's just <laughs> extraordinary. The Philippines, I did the rice harvest in the Philippines. Amazing. But do you know, I think my heart might lie in Kenya. There's something. You know, if you've got a box of toy animals, elephants, giraffes, and um, antelope, hippopotamuses, and tip them out on a piece of green cloth, that's kind of like Kenya was. They were just there like a toy box of animals, but the stories and the people and the wildlife and the environment. And it was actually easy for me to communicate in Kenya because um, they speak um, not only several native languages, but they speak English really well. So that made it much easier for me without having to go through an interpreter or just not understand. Okay. So in, in Peru, where I was, they, they spoke Quechuan, the ancient Inca language. So. We sort of communicated by being nice to each other. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's always a good strategy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, folks. So uh, we're pretty much getting to the end of our live stream. So we've got about two or three minutes left. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. If you have been painting along with John, we'd love to see what you've been up to. So teachers and parents, you can submit the children's finished artwork to the Last Chance to Paint website and then we can share that on the online gallery. In addition to that, it would be amazing if you could share any of the children's work or, or photos of the children working away in their classrooms or at home with us on social media. And the team here, uh, Rob and Tom, will put those links for you on the screen. So, just to mention as well, I couldn't let us all go today without mentioning Eden's resources. We have a wealth of resources for teachers. We also have a newsletter to sign up to. We have visits in person to Eden Project. We've had hundreds of school children here just today. So we'd love for you to get in contact and talk to us about how you might like to work with Eden Project. And I think it would be good actually, John, to finish with five 
from the forest, which means five quick fire questions for John Dyer, live from the rainforest. <laughs> okay. And we'll go for mostly one, one, one word answers, I reckon. Okay, we'll try. Yeah, we'll try. Yeah. Apart from maybe the last question, okay? Are oh. you ready? Yeah. Spoilers. Okay, go for it. Uh, Favourite plant to paint? Banana. Okay. Most magical place you have ever travelled to? Borneo. Average time to complete a painting? I can't answer that. Oh, that's impossible. Five years. Um, depends where I am. Okay, does take Borneo uh, two hours? Two hours. Wow, that's good. Um, where are you travelling to next? Australia. Australia, <laughs> lovely. Can I come? That's an extra question. Yeah, yeah you are welcome to come. Thank you very much. It would be great. Um, and finish this sentence for me, please. <laughs> I don't know this was all happening. Because I love to celebrate our world because our world is our survival and support system and it's beautiful. Lovely. Well, there you have it, everybody. Once again, a huge thank you from me, from John, from Emily, from Aaron, from the whole team here at Eden Project. We've had a great time live streaming to you guys today. We look forward to seeing you again soon and enjoy the rest of your day.